Hey, I'm Reinhard Kate, and welcome to episode 23 of The Ripple Drop. First up, we've got our most frequent guest, Ripple CTO David Schwartz, who's going to talk to you about NFTs and federated sidechains on the XRP ledger. Then we've got Ripple's Senior Manager for Diversity and Inclusion, Allison Crawford, who's going to talk about the company's efforts there. And last but not least, we're joined by Ripple's new Managing Director for Southeast Asia, Brooks Entwistle, who's going to talk about Ripple's global momentum. Let's get to it. To begin, David, uh, what is an NFT and what kind of impact do you think NFTs will have on the industry? An NFT, it stands for non-fungible token, and it's a token that means something that you can mint, buy, sell, trade, hold, that represents something unique in the real world. Like it could be even a physical object or a work of art. The use case we're seeing for NFTs today is mostly around collectibles. And that's certainly a big and important use case, and I don't want to take away from it. But I think that there are a lot of potential future use cases. A lot of us have sort of bundles of digital rights, like movies or songs that we purchased, books that you may have for a Kindle. And they're typically tied to services that have monthly fees or that we may want to leave. And so there's an interesting future use case of allowing people to sort of be their own custodians of their digital rights. So you've mentioned prior that not every blockchain can support NFTs. Uh, what do you mean by that? When you want to uh, trade with an NFT, or you want to create an NFT, you have issues involving things like transaction costs, transaction speed, and also just whether the blockchain has the capability to provide special functions like giving a cut of future sales to the originator of the NFT. But I think the big one is just the reliability, uh, particularly transaction fees. Like just to give an example, Ethereum has shown wide variability in its transaction fees, sometimes being very high, sometimes being very low. It's not a good customer experience if sometimes it's very difficult to trade an NFT and sometimes it's very easy to. David, how is the XRP ledger uniquely suited to enable NFT use? I think it has a number of features that make it very, very uh, desirable for NFTs. For one thing, it has the low cost and high speed that many sort of special purpose ledgers have, ledgers that are built just for NFTs. But it also has XRP, which is a, you know, a digital asset that has great liquidity um, directly available on the ledger. So you don't have to go to some other ledger to make the payment. The combination of really good payments with all the features necessary to support an NFT infrastructure, I think is unique. What kind of work is being done on the XRP ledger to make it an even better platform for NFTs? Yeah, there was a proposal that I authored that we've gotten feedback from the community on that makes uh, more features for NFTs. And in particular, it makes it uh, easier to produce large numbers of NFTs and makes them more scalable. I think we don't know what the level of NFT usage is going to be, but there are definitely like artists who've talked about like throwing NFTs out to the crowd at a concert. And if you want to scale to that level, it can't cost $100 to mint an NFT or it can't, you know, it can't take a minute. You need that level of scale. Really. Let's shift gears slightly. Uh, you've recently authored a blog proposal on federated sidechains as a new proposal for the XRP ledger. Could you kind of explain what a federated sidechain is and really how is that going to benefit the XRP ledger? A federated sidechain is a blockchain that operates sort of alongside another blockchain. So it has its own accounts, it can have its own transactions, it has its own transaction uh, fee structure, and so it can have different rules from the main ledger. And the idea would be that you could move assets from the main chain to the federated sidechain, transact those assets on the federated sidechain, and then at some point sort of mirror those results back to the main chain. What kind of impact and sort of improvement would that have for the XRP ledger as a whole? I think there are three big areas where it makes a difference. So one of them is just horizontal scalability. The XRP ledger can handle well over a thousand transactions per second, but that's a finite limit. And if you're imagining future use cases, you know, millions of NFTs or something, you can, you can exceed that limit because each federated sidechain has its own transaction volume. Another one is just the use cases. Like there's little to no support for DeFi on the XRP ledger. You could have a side chain to the XRP ledger, which you could have the same assets and you would have access to DeFi functions. And the last one is if some of the limitations of the XRP ledger uh, are affecting you. So the XRP ledger has an account reserve, which means it costs a certain amount of uh, money that you have to have available to create an account. A side chain could have a different reserve or no reserve. So it allows you to work around limitations that might affect particular use cases. One of the more popular proposals on the XRP ledger is hooks uh, that would enable smart contracts on the XRP ledger. How could federated sidechains interact with hooks? The federated sidechain feature will be tremendously useful for developers who are developing features like hooks that they want uh, as candidates for inclusion in the main chain. 
Today, without federated sidechains, when you develop a new feature, it's very hard to make the case that it should be included in the main chain. You can't prove that it's reliable and secure. You can't have it handle real money. You can only run it under test circumstances. With federated sidechains, you can run a federated sidechain that has hooks and it can handle real money and people can use it. And not only have you deployed it in the real world immediately, but now when you make the case that it should be included in the main chain, you can prove that it works. You can demonstrate that it, that it doesn't cause servers to crash or cause other problems. Um, you can demonstrate that it's secure in a real working environment much, much faster. In terms of application, uh, how soon could we see federated sidechains on the XRP ledger? Ripple's been focusing on private federated sidechains for central banks a lot uh, because we think that's one of the most obvious immediate use cases. I think you'll probably see those in a couple of months, uh, whether or not central banks will actually use them, but the technology will be there. And then I think seeing real centralized federated sidechains to provide features like DeFi is probably more like six to nine months away. Allison, what was the reasoning to create a more inclusive work environment at Ripple? Yeah, so about a year ago, just as the pandemic was kicking off, uh, Ripple made the decision to uh, create some new programming and a space to drive uh, diversity and inclusion efforts throughout the organization um, to improve uh, how we see differences and also to embrace those differences so people can do their best work. What kind of initiatives have been implemented to create more diversity and inclusion in the company? So our uh, diversity and inclusion efforts, I like to say that they're broken into kind of four different pillars. Uh, the first one being external. So this is how we showcase our brand and our efforts and how we tell our story. Um, it's also how we recruit and showcase um, our diverse workforce. When we take a look at internal work, that's around uh, kind of things like data collection. Um, it might be around promotion cycles. It could also be within um, our, again, our hiring practices and ensuring that there isn't bias within that process. Um, the fourth pillar is gonna be around ERG, activation and employee resource groups are really our superpower here at Ripple. Uh, we have seven of them, I'll go into them a little bit later, um, but really empowering them and ensuring that they're supported by our executive team. And last but not least would be capability building. And capability building is really partnering with our leadership and development team. That includes ensuring that we have diversity and inclusion as part of all of their existing programming, including our global leadership summit, our manager circles and everything in between. What's an employee research group or ERG and how many are there at the company? So we're coming up on our one year anniversary for our seven employee resource groups. And for those of you that aren't familiar, employee resource groups are employee led groups. They volunteer on top of their day jobs to support our, di our diverse communities. And we have seven of them that each have an executive sponsor and they run off what we call the 4C model. The four C's stand for culture, community, commerce, and careers. And that's to ensure that their work is really tied to our business initiatives. Of the ERGs here at Ripple, uh, which has the biggest opportunity to create sort of, you know, an impact on the culture of inclusion here at the company? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, it's, it's hard to answer because they all have great opportunity, right? But I feel like the real super actually is our ABLE at Ripple ERG. And that focuses on all different types of disabilities or differently abled people. And that includes things like depression, things like um, invisible disabilities, like if someone has dyslexia, and really understanding how we can be better to support those individuals so people can bring their whole selves to work. Ripple's a global company. How do you approach diversity and inclusion initiatives given the cultural differences and nuances that we see around the world? That's a great question. When we take a look at diversity and inclusion programming, sometimes we do hear that feedback that this feels very US centric given the disparities that we see with underrepresented groups within the US. But we know that there's less than equal access for women globally when it comes to economic advancement, um, access to education and everything in between as well too. So, what we do for our programming is we try to uncover the biggest opportunities within regions outside of the U.S. So it could be something along the lines of, again, um, ensuring there's equal access for women in our international offices. Um, it could be something along the lines of socioeconomic um, recognizing socioeconomic differences within Latin, our Latin American presence, um, but ensuring, again, that we're really catering each of those programs. 
Let's talk results. How, how have these initiatives created a more inclusive workplace and environment here? Yeah, I'll give you an example. So we implemented um, what a lot of companies have done. It's nothing new, but it's what's called the Rooney Rule. And that ensures that we are taking a look at at least two diverse candidates after a certain stage of the interview process to ensure that we're giving everyone a fair shot at our open roles. Um, and that actually, we implemented that almost exactly a year ago. And we've seen significant increase in what we call hires that identify as underrepresented people. Um, we've also seen uh, significant increases in our promotion cycles, our last three promotion cycles, um, when it comes to promoting women, which is really exciting. So recognizing those efforts and ensuring that there's gender parity within our, pro within our processes. What are you most excited about regarding the future of these initiatives? The biggest project that we rolled out um, in the first half this year was what we called the Global Self-ID Campaign. And the Global Self-ID Campaign allowed us to send out um, a survey to every single Rippler globally and ask all different questions around their identity to capture what our workforce demographics really look like. So it didn't so much focus on race and ethnicity like we traditionally do, but then also things like gender identity, sexual orientation, socioeconomic differences, so what's your highest level of education, and then also who raised you, what kind of household did you come from, um, disability status, veteran status, and then my favorite, caregiver status, because that's really important, right? because we know that caregiving has been um, a huge <laughs> topic in this last year. I'm sure you understand as well, too. We're wearing a lot of different hats as caregivers these days, so ensuring that we have uh, you know, our benefits in the right place when it comes to supporting that population. Brooks, thanks for joining us. You have a really interesting background, both in your career and outside the office environment. Talk us through what you did before you joined Ripple. Thank you, Reinhardt. It's great to be here today. I'm just super excited to, uh, to be at Ripple and to tell you a little bit about my story here and what we're up to in the APAC region. Um, I have been in Asia for 30 years, um, and it has been an extraordinary experience of, of building companies uh, and experiencing life over that period, and, uh, all of which really led up to decided to take on this Ripple experience. But I spent the bulk of my early years um, at an investment bank at Goldman Sachs. Uh, I arrived in Hong Kong in 1991 when there were fewer people in that office running APAC than there were at the Ripple office in Singapore today. Uh, and over the next couple of decades in Hong Kong, uh, India, and then in Singapore, I had the opportunity to be a part of a team there that really built out the region into the organization and the footprint that it is today. And it was an incredible experience um, scaling financial services across this growing and dynamic region. I had a, another experience in there which was important to leading up to the Ripple uh, role, which was to work at the UN in Cambodia for two years in the early 90s. Uh, after leaving Goldman the first time and before returning back after business school, uh, I served as a district uh, electoral supervisor in northern Cambodia in basically a war zone as the country was coming out of a terrible period in its history and before the UN had an election there, which was really my first experience of managing in super difficult environments, uh, cross-cultural teams, uh, and really working against the odds to pull off an election uh, in a rural jungle environment. And then finally on technology, I was a tech banker at Goldman in both um, the US as well as in Asia uh, during the first internet boom in the late 90s and had the opportunity to really build that uh, out across all these markets. And I always knew and was committed to the fact that if I could go in house at one of these companies, exciting dynamic growth companies, I would do so. And did have the opportunity to join Uber as they were building out uh, the region, building out APAC, uh, and just had a fantastic experience building, scaling, working with regulators, launching countries, uh, and actually eventually in some cases uh, selling off businesses as, as the business grew and then taking on an international role. What things are most important to our customers in Southeast Asia? We really kind of bring something that I think is incredibly valuable to this region. We need to um, jump on this opportunity of moving value, of moving money, of transacting across borders in ways that are fast, cheaper, more environmentally friendly, and most importantly, end up with the receiver on that, receiving that value, receiving that money, that currency, quickly in a way that they can get on with their life. Uh, and in many cases, as we've seen during COVID, do so in times of, of deep stress or emergency where the fact that we can move money faster and quicker 
and greener than anybody else matters to people's lives on the other end of that network. And there's a big remittance game, as you know, in the region. Uh, we really think about this region from the Middle East all the way to Japan and everything in between. So we have lots of senders uh, in our region and we have lots of receivers in our region, markets that are having this money flow back home, often from workers and uh, people that are really putting in hours to get money back to their families in their home countries. What kind of growth and momentum have you seen for our customers over the past year in the region? We had 10x growth on RippleNet from a transaction standpoint in 2020, uh, which is incredible. Uh, we've continued to build in the Middle East. We've continued to build in India, uh, the Philippines, Thailand, Australia, you name it. And again, one of the things we think about is just how, how big the footprint is and how much more we've got to do. But the growth has been there. One of the things that someone told me early on was put yourself in the way of growth. No matter what you do in a career, put yourself in the way of growth and everything else in some ways takes care of itself. And that's what we're doing here at Ripple in APAC. We're putting our teams and our technology in the way of exciting growth. Singapore's office is quickly growing at Ripple. What does that growth look like? We have a terrific office here in Singapore. First of all, this physical space is spectacular uh, and it's a great place to gather. And we were fortunate enough during most of COVID to be able to gather as a team. Uh, not always, but that's been an important part of building out the office. And one of the goals I set for my first 100 days at Ripple uh, was to fill 10 of those open slots uh, and get people onboarded quickly. And we did just that. We've added across all functions in the last 100 days uh, from CPS, to delivery, to business development, uh, to sales. We've added a regulatory head, a compliance head, um, and we importantly have another 10 roles plus open. And really, as you think about it, what Singapore and this APAC headquarters will represent is really a microcosm of the Ripple headquarters as well, a, a representation of most of our, and many of our functions uh, projecting themselves and going after the opportunity here in the region.